On January 8th, uh, 2010, a video was uploaded to YouTube. It was a three minute, 39 second video that immediately caught the imagination of the internet. It was uploaded by a guy named Paul Vasquez who lives in California, just outside of uh, Yosemite National Park. And this video uh, in the eight years that it's been on YouTube has been viewed 45 million times, but more than the number of views, it's become iconic as in a YouTube video. In fact, so iconic that YouTube headquarters has a meeting room that is named after this particular video. Um, if you haven't already guessed what video I'm talking about, um, let me show you a clip of this video, just a one minute segment. Uh, maybe you've never even seen it before, um, but a uh, word of warning um, for those of you who uh, can be offended by language, this guy um, is quite overwhelmed and finds, oh my God, a pretty relevant way for him to express that. So check out this video. Whoa, that's a full rainbow. All the way, double rainbow, oh my God. It's a double rainbow all the way. Whoa, that's so intense. Whoa, man. Whoa. 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 Oh my God, oh my God. Oh, oh my God. Whoa. Oh. God, look at that. It's starting to even look like a triple rainbow. Oh my God, it's full on. Double rainbow all the way across the sky. Oh my God. Oh my God. What does this mean? Oh. I think one of the things that captures the imagination of people when they watch it is not just um, watching Paul Vasquez have like a meltdown uh, in this incredibly goofy way. But he CNN interviewed him later and he said that People always ask him whether he was high. He said, it wasn't high. He said, it was just kind of overwhelmed with the, with the experience. But I think what people resonate with or what grabs people in the video is that you're watching somebody in real time have a profoundly moving spiritual experience on video. Like you're, you're watching him have a connection with transcendence, to encounter the divine. Um, you, you can hear the emotion in his voice. It, right after this clip, the next like 90 seconds, he just completely melts down. And I mean, it sounds like he's sobbing or he's laughing or some combination. Like it just becomes this intensely emotional experience for him. Um, I, I read through the transcript, you know, sort of, what he says during the video. It's, a, it's an incredible thing. 24 times in one way or another, he just expresses flat out awe, like wow, or whoa, or oh, or yeah, like he cheers at one point. Uh, 21 times he says, oh my God, in a three and a half minute video, just like, what else do you say? It's just kind of tumbling out of his mouth because he doesn't know what else to say. And outside of that sort of those expressions of being overwhelmed, he basically says two things in the video. Uh, the first, he comments on how overwhelming the experience is. He says it's so intense, it's so vivid, it's so bright, it's so beautiful. At one point he says it's too much. And he's not talking about the number of lumens with which the, the rainbow is radiating as the white light of the sun is being refracted through the prism of raindrops in the air. Like that, he's not making a comment on the brightness of this 
experience of physics before his eyes. He's, he's talking about the profundity of the experience, the depth of it for him. It's vivid and intense and it's too much. The other thing he does, three times he asks, what does it mean? What does it mean? And one time he says, tell me what it means. He, he tries to understand what it is that he experienced. And at some level, as I thought about this sermon, you know, which basically is a reflection of the question, I'm spiritual, so why do I need religion? The thought occurred to me that we all have these kinds of experiences. Maybe not with that sort of intensity, and maybe 45 million people haven't seen us have it. But we all have these, uh, at various points in our life, these sort of profoundly spiritual experiences maybe it's you know at the birth of a child or maybe it's you know at at a moment when you experienced a miraculous cure or your life was saved and you kind of feel like you have a second chance at life or um, maybe it's when you discovered a, a higher power in the process of recovery from addiction or just kind of being overcome by the beauty of art or music or architecture we have these kinds of moments where we feel like Um, We're overwhelmed with a sense of awe, like we're having some sort of direct encounter with something more than just regular life. CNN follows up with Vasquez, like I said, and, and he says, I felt like in that moment that I was in contact with something greater than myself. These experiences are like pure and innocent in a way. They're like, they're like what life in an undefiled way is supposed to to feel like. And my guess is that you've had these experiences. I I have, I know. Um, In the summer of 2008, my wife Chris and I traveled to Italy for two weeks. Uh, My mom had died about a month earlier and we just needed to get away and just be by ourselves and grieve and think and, and whatever. And in our first day in Italy, We were riding a bullet train from Rome to Naples and I was just watching the Italian countryside go by when all of a sudden it occurred to me that Italy was one of the last places that my mom traveled with my dad before she got really sick and couldn't travel anymore. And and in that moment, I kind of just sensed this deep connection with who my mom was. And, And actually that whole Italian vacation I experienced through the lens of thinking about the fact that my mom had been there not that long before me. And I would always like ask as we were going to certain places or doing things like, was my mom here, right? And, and if she was, what would my mom have thought about Pompeii? Or what would my mom have thought about the, the Colosseum? And if she hadn't been here, right, driving the Amalfi Coast or whatever, <clears throat> the question in my head was always, what would my mom have, would my mom have loved this? And, and what would she have thought of this? And it kind of all culminated for me. It was the last night of our vacation. We were eating at a a, a restaurant, a really beautiful restaurant called Tortuga in a small town called Monterosso in the north Mediterranean coast of Italy. And we were sitting on the patio, which was sort of a pedestrian boulevard, and there was a stone wall. And on the other side of the wall was a cliff that you know, bordered the Mediterranean and the sun was setting and the sky was on fire and the sea was beautiful and the food was delicious and my wife and I were sitting there together in the quiet and I just, all of a sudden I was overcome and I just, I burst into tears. Both at the beauty of it all. Like it was just, it was beauty stacked up at a level that I, could, I didn't know how to process. And then simultaneously in the grief that my mom never got to experience. And she would, have, she would have loved it. But it stands out to me as one of those moments where I felt like I was encountering something deeper than reality, than life. We've all had those experiences. There's a guy by the name of Gary Thomas who wrote a book called Sacred Pathways. And Gary Thomas says that our uniquenesses, our individuality, kind of gives us our own way to have our spirituality. He says, for some of us, we are triggered spiritually by nature, right? Like double rainbow guy, Paul Vasquez, like we're triggered when we're in the garden or when we're in the mountains or on a hike or camping, like being out in 
nature is where we find ourselves in that divine place, having spiritual experiences. For some of us, he says, like me in Italy, he says, for some of us, our spiritual experiences are more sensual in nature. There, there are senses, the taste and the touch and the smells and the, and the sights, all the ways that we absorb beauty. But for others of us, he says, our more natural way to have spiritual encounters is <clears throat> more on the ascetic side, but in solitude and aloneness and quiet and silence. For some of us, we have profoundly spiritual encounters in, in uh, the, you know, surrounded by people in the midst of celebration. I've had sort of spiritual experiences at uh, rock concerts that have bordered on feeling like worship. I'm watching, you know, Peter Gabriel. Um, for other people, it's more contemplative. It's what happens in your heart and in your imagination. Thomas says, there are some folks who feel the divine wind at their back, you know, as they're uh, serving um, or as they're, they're fighting for justice. And other people feel kind of the closeness of God when they're caring for somebody who's hurting. For me, when it comes to these pathways, there's two that seem to matter to me. Uh, Thomas says that um, some of us are traditionalists. That's actually the, the rituals and the symbols the historic sort of ways of having spiritual encounters, even religious encounters that are meaningful. And, and to me, um, I just, in the morning, my favorite way to pray is to sit with the Catholic prayer book and to read prayers composed by other people, including scriptures, but throughout the history of the church and just connecting with how other people have prayed to God. For me, I, reading in general, he calls it the intellectual pathway. I, some of you know I'm in school. Um, lately, some of the most profound experiences I've had are reading the writings of a secular Jewish philosopher named Martin Buber, uh, who's writing about uh, people's relationships with each other in a book called I and Now. I, I, I'll just read you one quote. Martin Buber writes this. This really struck me. He said, in every sphere... Through everything that becomes present to us, we gaze towards the train of the robe of the eternal you. In each, we perceive a breath of it. In every you, we address the eternal you. In every sphere, according to its manner. And I read that, and, and what I felt like God was saying, I felt like God was inviting me into a relationship with him, reminding me that in everyone and in everything that I encounter, all of it radiates the divine. That every perception I have in life is God whispering to me. And every time I address a word to anybody else, I am responding to God in a form of prayer. And it was just, I had to journal it and just, uh, think about it, reflect on that for a long period of time because God just met me in that moment in the writings of a secular Jewish philosopher who wasn't even writing about spiritual things. My point is only to affirm the fact that we are spiritual beings in ways that aren't dependent on religious structures. And so there, there is an underlying validity to the question, if I'm a spiritual person, why do I need religion? Especially because, now I'll affirm the other half of that question, especially because in some ways, like the late Christopher Hitchens has said, in some ways it seems like religion poisons everything. Right? It, it, you don't have to think too hard to begin to come up with examples of the ways in which religion has seemed to make the world worse. People fight because of religion. I just think about the wars, whether it's the Crusades in the Middle Ages, whether the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, whether it's the, the Hindu-Muslim conflict in India, it's ISIS fighting to set up a caliphate, it's the Buddhists persecuting the Muslims and the Tamil minority in Southeast Asia. Like, people fight because of religion. Think about the ways that religion has tried to suppress the thoughts of free-thinking people whether the Salem witch hunts or, or the Spanish Inquisition, the most famous trial at the Spanish Inquisition was Galileo. And the church forced Galileo to recant his mathematical proof that the earth revolves around the sun because they said he was reinterpreting scripture in a way the church did not approve. Think about the way the church has been complicit in colonialism, in 
the literal and cultural genocide of indigenous people, of residential school nightmares. The church, it seems at times, hasn't been a positive force in our world. I've read a couple studies published in the last 10 years about people's perception of the church. One was published in a book called Unchristian. The other in a book called They Like Jesus But Not the Church. And, and the same kinds of themes emerge. That when people look at the church, and we're going to just talk about the church from this point because this is my tradition, our tradition. Um, I say the Christians are hypocritical. They don't live what they profess. They say one thing and do another. In fact, in some ways, the people will say the lives of the Christians that I know can be worse than the lives of the unreligious people that I know. And yet it doesn't, you know, slow Christians down, people say, from being judgmental, from looking down their long noses at everybody who disagrees with them or who lives differently than they do. In fact, people single out two kinds of culture war that Christians seem to want to fight against folks they disagree with. They, people isolate patriarchy as an example of the church suppressing the voices and the leadership of women and they talk about homophobia. The, the church sort of uh, pushing away anybody that doesn't fit the heterosexual norm of what the church has you know, believed for centuries. People talk about the church as being too political. And certainly we're seeing <clears throat> evidence of it in the States in real time. White evangelicalism endorsing a, a white supremacist, white nationalist agenda in the uh, current American administration. But it's not the only time that the church has been involved in fighting political culture wars. It says the church is the Culture says churches is too exclusivistic as though we believe that we've got all the truth and nobody else has anything to teach us and we just sort of exclude anybody who doesn't believe like us. And it kind of makes you think, why would I take these sort of pure and innocent spirituality that I've experienced and even tried to nurture in my life and take it into an environment like that? Now, the one thing I would say about the church religion poisoning thing, I think I would want to say, and this is by no means an excuse because the church is, the things that get said about the church are true. But um, not true because of religion. I would want to say, I think, true because of institution. There's a, a theologian named Walter Wink who says that when the Bible talks about the power of the demonic, what it means at the very least, among other things, is the institutional power of darkness to be an oppressive and evil force in our world. So in Ephesians chapter 6, for example, it says this, our struggle is not against flesh and blood human beings, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil, in the heavenly realms. When the, when the Bible, Wink says, talks about the powers of this dark world and the spiritual force of evil, uh, among other things, you have to imagine that it's talking about the evil that can be latent in institutions and systems that become oppressive. So it's not just white evangelicals that are uh, uh, promoting a white nationalist agenda in America. We're seeing a white nationalist agenda resurgent all the way through Western political world in Germany, in Greece, you know, in uh, England, and so on. That in some ways, politics as an institution can become a source of corruption. Um, not just politics, but uh, school systems, educational institutions, the stories that come out of Michigan State covering up decades of sexual assault by Dr. Larry Nasser against more than 160 athletes at Michigan State that he worked on over the course of years. Corporations can become oppressive, evil institutions. You know, take a guy like Jeff Bezos, who's not the enemy, the owner of Amazon. The Bible says we don't fight against flesh and blood. But he is worth $105 billion, makes $90 million a day, and the workers in his warehouse are on government assistance because they don't make a living wage. That's, 
There's evil to that. Just think about the entertainment industry and the Me Too movement that started in Hollywood but has infected the music industry and uh, theater and, and is infecting churches and politics. And I mean, I think Wink has a point in saying there is an evil to institutionalism um, that we always need to be aware of. And religion, in as much as it can become an institution, can feed into that. But what if we didn't think of religion? What if religion wasn't an institution or a structure? What if that's not how we encountered it? What if instead, religion was a community of people who were together journeying towards a deeper understanding and a greater commitment to the spirituality that they were experiencing and sharing with each other. If that were what we meant by religion, if that's what we were trying to be as a church, then how would our spirituality feed into that? What could we gain by bringing our spirituality into relationship with a religious community whose goal was that? Right? And I think there are four things. Number one, you would gain the value of belonging. Right? If, if this could be a community, if a religious community could be a place where people surround each other with the goal of understanding each other and understanding experience, with the goal of sharing in this journey that we're all on together, how could we love and support and journey together with each other with this sense of belonging towards a deeper engagement with this um, spiritual encounter with the divine that we were sharing in common. Right? The Bible describes something like this in a lot of places, but in one place, Hebrews chapter 10, it says this, let us consider how we might spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. How could we encourage each other towards love and good deeds on the basis of these experience of transcendence that we've had? Um, Paul Vasquez said to CNN that part of the legacy of his experience with the double rainbow was a commitment to be the kind of person who unites humanity together. This sort of one of the common impulses of these spiritual encounters that we have is this sense, this drive that compels us towards love. What if on the heels of that, we surround ourselves with a community, we belonged to a place where the role of the community around us was to encourage us towards that love. Not in a way that creates uniformity or conformity, but a way that generates unity in how we walk with each other towards loving God deeper and loving ourselves better and loving each other in a way that's fuller and, and loving the entire world. What if this random experience became this journey towards love in community? That's the first thing, a sense of belonging. The second thing is a sense of understanding. What if as a part of the journey with that community, we came to understand our experience in a deeper way? One of the things that Vasquez says in the video over and over again is, what does it mean? And like I said, he says, tell me what it means. He reaches beyond himself. He looks to a source outside of himself to say, somebody help me understand what I've experienced. And I think that's what the community ultimately is for, to journey together, not just in love, but in a sense of belonging with each other, but to journey together towards a deeper understanding of the experiences that we have in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says this, all scripture is God breathed. In other words, the, the Bible is filled with the breath and the life of God. It is a place where we can encounter the living presence of God. And because of that, it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in living rightly with God and with ourselves, with each other in the world, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Um, I believe as a part of the a Christian religious community that centers on the uh, way that God makes himself known 
among other ways, all the ways I talked about before, but also through the scriptures. As we gather as a community around the scriptures, we can, um, <clears throat> we can allow our communal reading of what God says in the Bible to shape the way that we think and to shape the people that we become. Right? Not in a way that professes to have all the answers. Nobody has all the answers. Christianity does not have the market cornered on truth. There is much to learn from all sorts of diverse perspectives. This isn't a place to get, quest, to get um, answers as much as it is a place to ask questions. And I mean, yes, there are some answers, but it is a place to ask questions. It's not a place where we're all forced to believe the same thing. It's a place where in the diversity of communities, we listen to people's diverse experiences and diverse perspectives and diverse understandings. We begin to understand what God has taught about himself in the Bible in a way that we could have never arrived at on our own. So we get an experience of belonging. We get an experience of understanding. I believe that we get an experience of meaning. Right? One of the things that happens in these sorts of spiritual experiences is you begin to think about what does this mean now for the rest of my life? Right? When you, um, if your life is saved, this is the whole point of the movie Saving Private Ryan. Um, I'll confess this to you. I would never recommend this movie to anybody. It was the point of the movie Pulp Fiction. Uh, which was a profoundly spiritual experience for me to watch that movie. Again, I do not recommend this movie to anybody. I'm just saying. That when your life gets spared from certain disaster, you end up asking the question, what now will I do with my second chance with the rest of my life? You know, somebody has a child and all of a sudden they begin to contemplate going back to church. Why? Because the, the profundity, the depth of this experience of becoming a parent now causes you to think, what kind of person do I want to be for the sake of my child? What sort of life do I want to invite them into? And you begin to rethink your priorities. This is what Vasquez is all about. He says, I, I was processing, you know, this, the, uh, meaning of this experience and I felt like God was saying he wanted me to be like Noah and to unite people under the rainbow. Now I kind of wonder if he had been a part of a community that could help him process the scriptures. Maybe he'd understand the story of Noah differently than he does but but the whole point is I had this encounter and and it, it gave me a meaning and a purpose for the rest of my life. This is how the scriptures talk about religion. When it uses the word religion positively, which is not very often. This may, the verse I'm about to read may be the only time. This is what it says in James chapter 1. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress. And to keep oneself by being polluted by the world, religion the way God envisions it is the kind of force that is at work communally and biblically in a person's life that shapes them into the kind of person who devotes themselves to caring in love for people who aren't themselves, for pouring themselves out, for, for being and doing or becoming and doing what Jesus was and did, which is somebody who always poured himself out in love for the forgotten, the ignored, the least, the ones who'd been kicked to the curb and the marginalized by society. Jesus continually reached out in love towards them. What if, as we nurture our individual spirituality and bring it into the belonging of the community, which helps us come to an understanding of who God is and what he's inviting us into, we begin to discover together the meaning of giving our lives away to people in need. What a way to deconstruct the hypocrisy of people who say, you don't look, I like Jesus, but you, you don't look very much like Jesus. What a way to begin to deconstruct the judgmentalism by building relationship with people that other folks have kicked to the side. And we have too. It's about becoming something different, finding a sense of meaning. And finally, you have belonging, understanding, meaning. What if... Because of a religious community like this one, we could build a sense of enduring. 
Because here's the truth. The, the way we've been talking about spirituality this morning is a pretty sanitized version. You have this pure, innocent encounter with God and you get ushered into this community of love that teaches you to understand what God is all about and gives you this life of meaning of pouring out the love of God into the lives of other people and so on. There comes a time in pretty well everybody's life where all of that kind of falls apart and just doesn't you know, work anymore. It comes a moment, life crisis, faith crisis, mental health crisis, emotional crisis, relational crisis, vocational crisis, whatever, financial crisis, whatever happens to be, where all of a sudden the God who once seemed so close now feels like he's nowhere to be found. Once the answers that seem so clear now don't seem to make sense of your experience anymore. Now, once the, the things that used to work, you know, in life don't seem to be working anymore. And in the midst of the chaos of that season of the journey, the temptation is going to be to just give up and walk away or to flop down and grow angry and bitter to get stuck in your life or to to kind of retreat and fake it till you make it put on a plastic smile and pretend that everything is fine and what if right at that moment we were surrounded by a community who were committed to not letting us fall We read these verses a couple weeks ago in Isaiah 43. God says this, don't be afraid. I've redeemed you. I've called your name, you're mine. When you're in over your head, I'll be there for you. When you're in rough waters, I'll not, you'll not go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end because I am your God, your personal God. God makes this commitment to being with us in the moments when everything's falling apart. And the way that God is usually with us in those moments is in the hands and the feet of the community with which he surrounds us. A community that doesn't judge us for finding it hard. A community that doesn't blame us for the fact that life is blowing up. A community that doesn't pretend that it has all the answers, but is willing just to sit and to listen and to be present and continue to journey with us as we press through to the other side in this, in this spirituality that is enduring because of the religious community that we find ourselves in. What if that's the point? What if God has made us to be spiritual people who are continually having encounters with him in various ways in in our life? Um, But what if the point is that we were never meant to do that spirituality by ourselves, but we were meant to step into a religious community who is journeying together with us towards a a greater depth, leaning into these experiences that we share with each other, you know, in worship, in relationship, through whatever. And through that experience, we find a sense of belonging, and we find a sense of understanding, and we find a sense of meaning, and we find a sense of enduring. And that this Community together is the way that we all become more deeply connected and more deeply reflective of this thing that we experienced in the first place. Because that's, I think, what we want to be. We don't do it perfectly, but this is who we want to become for the sake of all of us. Let's pray together. Father, I'm thankful for the ways that you have met each one of us in our own unique way, in our own unique experiences. The ways in which the the veil between heaven and earth seems to get thin and we, we feel like we're encountering you in this profound and direct, transformative way. I pray, God, that you would allow us 
in our community and communities like ours to become the kinds of religious communities that nurture belonging and understanding and meaning and enduring for for those of us who are on the journey together so we can lean in and discover you and discover each other and discover life the way it was always intended to be. Would you give each of us the courage to lean in, to be that for others and to open ourselves for others to be that with us and may we find you in the midst as we learn to do that. We pray These things in Jesus' name. Amen.